of the last days. What an interesting subject. You know, there will be an ark in the end times. As there was in Noah's day, there was an ark. Will the earth be flooded again with water? No, not at all. But there is a flood coming. And it's a flood that if you're not aboard the ark, then you're in trouble. You're in big trouble as the deception of the end times uh, moves upon us. Christ was asked in Matthew 24 when he gave those seven events that consummate the end of this age, what it was going to be like just, you know, at the time of his return. And he gave a very specific um, uh, event and what you could liken it to. And you'll find it in Matthew chapter 24, along about verse 37. As you turn there, I'm going to say, let's have a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. One of the things that Christ was asked how it would be like at his second advent, or you might say the end of this dispensation. This was his answer in one of the seven. And he stated in verse 37 of Matthew 24, But as the days of Noah, which is Noah in the Hebrew, were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be just like that when I come back again. So that's something you want to kind of perk your ears up and open your spiritual mind. What's he talking about? 38. For as in the days that were before the flood... They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now let's go on with verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also, so also shall, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Two times for emphasis that that's how it's going to be when I return to the earth. They're going to be doing that. And of course we know from other studies that one of the main things is that Satan's little fallen angels were cast, had left their first habitation. Well, let's turn to Genesis 6. Let's read it again. It won't hurt us and, it's, and, uh, and we should. What was happening there? Let's analyze it and... Um, then build our ark, that is to say our spiritual ark, whereby we can understand how you escape um, the flood of the end times, which again, I repeat, is not a flood of water. This is what was happening before the flood in Noah's time. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply, this is to say Adamic people, so... On the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, verse 2, that the sons of God, interesting what, these are Nephilim, the angels, saw the daughters of men here on earth, that they were fair, they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all which they chose. In other words, the supernatural, rather than being born to woman, came to earth and took earth woman of all who they chose. This is why that Paul would teach in 1 Corinthians, what is it, chapter 10 uh, or 11, that a woman should keep herself covered, meaning the cri covered with Christ, the veil, because of the angels. All right? Why? They're coming back again. All right? They're going to be here again. And in part, this is part of the ark, a part of the sign of the ark of the end times, of how you know, or else it will be as it was in Noah's time, it'll be too late, friend. The flood will already be here and over with before you would know that you needed to be aboard an ark. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. In other words, that was the first generation. Many people up until this time lived to be almost a thousand, such as Methuselah. 
He cut the time, 120 years generation, and the longest generation that we can account for in our day and time. And one more verse. There were giants, these are Geba, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Now, do you have trouble understanding this? Listen carefully. And they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old. That means even the first earth age, men of renown. This is why God would not tolerate the mixing of these Nephilim, fallen angels. You with companion Bibles, you have an entire appendix on uh, Nephilim, the giants or the fallen angels. God would not tolerate why. Satan had already attempted to destroy Eve through which he knew that the Savior would come. God had already told him, however, the contrary to that in Genesis 3.16, that because of that conception, that the Christ child would bruise his head, that is to say Satan's head, but Satan would bruise his heels, which they were as they were nailed to the cross. But inasmuch as that had not been successful, inasmuch as God marked the offspring of that, which is to say Cain, then here he has his little hunchman, henchman to attempt to destroy the daughters of Eve, whereby destroying the coming of Messiah. Another attempt of Satan's. Well, don't worry, it's going to happen all over again. Is, is this not mentioned in the New and many people are really shocked because they don't read God's word all that much. And they said, is it possible that could have happened? It did happen. But it is an abomination before God to mix in this way. He t holds a very dim view of it. Why? Because God has a plan of salvation. And his plan of salvation is going to come to pass exactly as it's written. Have you ever read it? Going to happen exactly as it's written. In the New Testament, of course, in the book of Jude, the, these uh, same beings are spoken of and what their outcome will actually be. And in as much as Jude has, Jude has only one chapter, go to the fourth verse of the book of Jude. It'll tell you basically how this came to pass. And verse 4 of Jude reads, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained. To this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, uh, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they wanted nothing to do with the Father, for they were the lieutenants at Satan's fall that rebelled, wanted to do things their way. This is what happens to them. Verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance. I've told you about this long ago, but I will remind you again. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. In other words, God will destroy. Um, the example, of course, he's saying is he killed a generation in the wilderness, left them there. Verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate. What is their first estate? Well, an angelic being is not supposed to be on this earth unless dispatched by God as a messenger. They're supposed to be in heaven. They left heaven, seeing the daughters of men. That man was made in the image of God and the angels. And yet God then, uh, taking the curve from the man, creating the woman, and she was beautiful. And rather than being born to a woman, they seduced her. Okay. They left their first estate, but left their own habitation. 
He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And so it is. So it is that they wait. And they will have their judgment. And their judgment is severe. They are, quite frankly, the 7,000 that will die in the streets of Jerusalem the moment the two witnesses rise from, from um, that Pata street in that uh, area. Now, how can you say then that there is a flood in the end times if, it's not go if there isn't going to be a flood of water? Well, it's written. And it also uh, is so much akin do that, do you remember what Christ said? Do I need to remind you from Matthew 24? Just like in the days of Noah before the flood. That's the way it's going to be when I return. So what we're about to read, aside from the two witnesses' death in the street of Jerusalem, you're about to hear one of the events that announces the second advent. For it's a very short time after the things we're about to read. How did they leave their first habitation? How could that be? They're supposed to be in heaven. Well, know this. As we have read many times, and I probably threw a question and answer of where Satan is, have answered in heaven, uh, um, I don't know how many times. But we're going to pick it up. And we're going to learn of the flood for as it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. I repeat, his angels. Who are Satan's angels? The Nephilim, the fallen ones. Those in chains we just read of in Jude. Eight, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. I mean, it's over for them as far as, as being the accuser of the brethren. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. He was the dragon in the first earth age. He's the dragon in this generation. He was the old serpent in the garden, called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. How much of it? The whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And this was the reason here that Paul would say, women should cover, keep themselves covered with Christ. I realize this comes anywhere from cutting hair to wearing hats. And that's not what it's talking about. Their covering is supposed to be Christ. All right, that keeps the angels, these fallen angels, when they're cast out, away from them. Will they be um, uh, uh, going for the women again? Yes, that's the answer. Paul warned, and it's quite obvious there's nothing new under the sun. They did it before, and they will have a heyday of it this time. Verse 10, And let there be no fear in any female's heart because of the Nephilim, if you have Christ, your orders are their command. They cannot harm you. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, that's to say his anointed one. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. As you've read in the book of Job, that's his purpose. Each time that God would have you do something, Satan may, has a heyday, all right? He is our accuser, and certainly with our imperfections, it's quite easy for him to find something to accuse us of. But this is why there would be silence in heaven for a half hour, as it was mentioned in an earlier chapter. The, rook, the rookus is gone. He that causes the trouble is gone. But where is he? Here on earth. His spirit. Now, now follow with me. Evil spirits are on earth today. Many people call them demonics. They're evil spirits. Satan's evil spirit can roam the earth this day. But not here in the body de facto. But they're coming. And 
and Satan will naturally be the false Christ, the spurious Messiah that Jesus didn't say maybe would come, but absolutely would come. All right? So the accuser is down here. What's he going to be doing? Hey, he's in the business of accusing, my friend. He's going to play Jesus. Verse 11. He's going to be telling people, I've come to rapture you away, and I am your Savior. Verse 11. That's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For those that have difficulty believing, for many were deceived by the first letter of Thessalonians, especially chapter 4, into thinking there was going to be a flying away. He'll give them what they want. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. That's how you overcome him. You don't have to give in to him. And by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And of course, Satan is death. Never be afraid of him. Verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens. I mean, you got peace there. Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and, to, and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, He's because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. This is a very short time. As a matter of fact, you know how long a time he has, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the, unto the earth, he persecuted, what's he going to do? He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. That means Mother Israel, as well as any other uh, people that are in Christ, in the blood of Christ on this earth. If he has an opportunity, if you allow it, he will accommodate you. You don't have to mess with him. And I guarantee you, it doesn't take him long to know who he can mess with and who he can't. Don't be a wet noodle Christian. Christians don't have to take anything off Satan or anyone else. Verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. That's to say the earth itself. It's good to us, beloved. Into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. In other words, that's three and a half years she is nursed. Who nurses her? The Holy Spirit. God's spirit and the blood of the Lamb. That's how you overcome him. If you don't have that, friend, and maybe you're beginning to see a little bit of a picture of the ark of the last days here. If you get outside of that ark, you've got heap trouble, friend. Verse 15, and the serpent, get ready for it, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. This is the flood of the end times that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The flood of what? The flood of his lies. Now, you either are going to be in the ark of Christ, that is to say the very truth, the word of God, that Christian ship that Christ would go to sleep in and wake up and they would be con uh, concerned about falling and he's still the wind. He will do that for you in any spiritual flood that arises in your life if you have him in your ark because it's his blood, under his blood, and his spirit, the Holy Spirit, that you will have the victory. And Satan's lies will run off of you like water off of a duck's back. You are immune. Many people feel they've got to rush somewhere and hide. You don't, we don't, you don't have to hide. We are champions of God. Warriors with the gospel armor on and in place. That's what the gospel armor for is for, is to fight the spiritual fight, not to fly away and hide somewhere. It's wartime. And there are soldiers and there are those that would like to think they are soldiers. The flood is coming. 
and you must be in the landing craft that will have no difficulty navigating the waters to the place of, of, of um, uh, embarkation, to disembark, that is to say. Verse 16, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, God's good to us, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The earth will do that for you if you simply watch the signs of the earth. There's a great deal of knowledge there. But God sent his word to this earth long, long ago. And if you absorb that word, and if you keep yourself forewarned is to be forearmed, the flood, Satan's flood, and there's going to be a flood by Satan in the last days. How are you fixed, friend? You got some oars, or do you paddle with your hands? Knowledge, wisdom, creates the ark, the blood of the lamb, and having the lamb with you makes that spiritual ark loaded with people that have owned the gospel armor that Satan. Why do you put the Why do you put the gospel armor on, as it is written? in Ephesians chapter 6, to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. His lies. They have none effect upon you. Okay. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That means God's election, his elect. Which keep, they do what? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What does Jesus Christ mean? It's two words that it's very easy in the English to take for granted. What does Jesus mean when translated back to the original language? Yeshua, which is to say Yahweh's Savior. And what does Christ mean? The anointed one, the one God has anointed to accomplish these things, the one God has anointed to give the testimony which you repeat that protects you and it's like caulking your ark of the last days with his truth and it cannot sink in the flood of Satan's lies. Now, what about this short time business? Well, if you're thinking, and we had a mention of three and a half years, but we know that for the elect's sake, God shortened that time. We know it very well. But we also know that in the ninth chapter, you're told how long that short time would be. Are you familiar with it? We just covered this book of Revelation, so it should be real sharp in your mind. Revelation chapter 9 Verse 4, let's read it. What does it say? This is when, this is when the fifth uh, uh, angel sounded and the star fell from heaven, which was uh, Satan. That's his name, Lucifer. Lucifer means morning, the bright morning star. The fake, of course. And the locust came up from the pit, meaning his children, along with his little angels up. Verse 4 of chapter 9, the question is, how long is that short period? How long will that flood last? Verse 4, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, meaning they certainly weren't locusts, because that's what locusts hurt. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. What is the seal of God in your forehead? It's God's truth, this word, that makes your ark, that protects you. And this is your proof. Satan is told, you cannot touch those in the ark of God that had the testimony of Jesus Christ, that is to say, in their foreheads, that is in their mind, not sitting on a shelf somewhere gathering dust. Now, you're, you're not going to get any closer to the protection of the ark than that verse. 
I mean, it can't be documented any clearer than that what your overall protection is during the time, that five-month period that Satan's lies flood the earth. It's to have the seal of God here. Why? Truth. And someone that is armed with truth knows better than to believe lies. And do lies have, do lies have power? Answer, no. Unless you believe them. And then it can have power of messing up, of accusing, of being in the flood, of the turmoil. You rise above that. Verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them. That's even those that are kind of a little bit biblically illiterate. They can't kill them, but that they should be tormented five, I repeat, Five, that's one, two, three, four, five, five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, I need not tell you how that a scorpion takes it. How, how can they, how, how will they bother a man if they can't kill him? Well, a scorpion normally, unless, unless someone goes into anaphylactic shock for various uh, re medical reasons, then a scorpion's not going to kill you. But it's going to hurt plenty. But it is the manner that the scorpion has no stomach, so with his pinchers he pulls his victim to him after having st stung him with the sting of his tail to addle him, and he regurgitates into the skin of the victim, and the victim's body becomes the scorpion's stomach, meaning it turns everything inside you to mush. Those digestive juices, meaning you've got no backbone, friend. And that's what they'll do to you if you allow it. That is the way in which they operate. But how long? Five months. And God is really good to us because... What five months does that specific uh, stage or phase of the locust life last? It lasts only five months. It's a very natural thing. And it's May through September. And that's it. Well, are you trying to tell me that's when Antichrist is coming? Well, you could certainly read that into it. But don't let him deceive you if he comes in the middle of winter. Now, I want to skip on, if we may, to the 10th verse. We... Anytime you find a five-month period, you've got to have a double witness, all right? So skip to the 10th verse of the ninth chapter of Revelation. And it speaks of how they operate. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. There you have it again. May through September. Who's over? Who's in charge? Verse 11. And they had a king over them. This will give us our answer. This will tell us who's over this enemy that approaches God's children for that five-month period, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Friend, there is only one. That old cherubim, angel, Lucifer, Satan, the uh, son of perdition, there's only one, don't look past it, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is a babdon, that is to say the accuser. Do you know who the accuser is? The destroyer. It only fits one. You don't have to look past that. That's in the Hebrew. And in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. That's the prime root of Satan's name in the Greek. There's only one. You don't have to look past that. And there you have it. A flood of lies is the flood. That's why Christ would say it's going to be exactly as it was in the days of Noah. How fascinating that they would be able to bother anyone that did not have the seal of God in their forehead. And what does that say to you, friend? You'd better have the seal of God in your forehead. That is the exact opposite of receiving the mark of this son of perdition in your forehead as well. The mark of the beast, as it is called. Uh, 
It simply means deception in your mind. What do you have in your forehead, your brain? Use it. That five-month period. And our Father, good enough that He would spare us any tribulation with that first tribulation of the spurious Messiah. All you have to do is use this. It's not that difficult. It is written. Have you never read it? Well, how could that be any how could that be akin to or in any relationship? But let's we were in Genesis six. Let's go back. I'm chasing you around a little bit, but that's fine. Live and learn. All right? Genesis chapter seven. If I remember right, we're going to go to the last verse in that little old chapter. Chapter 7 in the book of Genesis. And it's called verse 24. How long was the flood, as far as the water, that flood that really rampaged in Noah's time, how long did it last? Chapter 7, verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. Well, let me, let me think for a moment. 150 days. Well, figuring 30 days to the month, um, 5 times 30 just happens to be 150 days. So the same prevailing of water that was set forth by Noah's flood, a five-month period, will be the same five months that the flood of Satan's lies will prevail if, if you allow it in this end generation. Hey, friend, what is your ark? It's your knowledge, your trust, your love in our Father, in His Word. For simply having placed in your forehead the seal of God, which is to say His truth, do you not remember in Revelation chapter 7, when we were studying there, the four angels that cover the four spirits, that cover the four winds, that bring about the end of this earth age, were about to bring it to pass, and this one angel approached with a loud voice saying, Stop! Until we place the seal of God in the foreheads of those that in which it's supposed to be. How are you fixed, friend? You need to understand your Father's Word. There's power in it. It puts an immune, it puts, it, it causes you to be immune from anything that Satan has to throw at you as long as you're on guard. How fascinating. Oh well, five months here, five months there, five months in the beginning, five months in the end is probably all an accident. Some might say, well, Dream on, sleep on, sleepyhead, and get ready for a stinging because there are stings in their tail and their tails are going to strike you if you have a big empty spot up here. So don't run on half empty. It's better to run on half full than half empty, all right? And what I'm saying is think positive, get into his word. Caulk up that ship and make it float through the lies and deceptions of this earth age, the tragedy that goes on around you. Take power over your own life uh, by having that seal, which is the blood of the Lamb, the true Lamb. Only the true Lamb can save you. The fake has other plans for you. Okay. We'll stop there, but we're going to take this another step further in the next lecture. All right. All right. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. The ark of the last days, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end. It is amazing in a spiritual way, the book of Genesis, in the prophecies given to the 12 patriarchs and the flood, and then Christ telling us in Matthew 24, hey, as it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be just like that again at the end. And so we find that. We really do. Now, 
in the 13th chapter of Mark, we are told that this that when Satan is cast to the earth, that he will pose as our father, as the savior, that is to say, and that we will be delivered up. The true Christian, I repeat, the true Christian will be delivered up so that the Holy Spirit can speak through them, both men and women. And that gives the Holy Spirit an opportunity. But he makes a statement in that 13th chapter of Mark, as well as the 24th chapter of Matthew, about woe to those that are with child when I return. And it has to do with uh, those that participate in a marriage with what they think is the lamb because he looks like the lamb, but his voice is the dragon, which is to say the spurious Messiah, the false Christ that Jesus would speak of. So it is and Christ even, how, how forceful is this woe to those that are with child? And what it, it doesn't mean a mother carrying a child in her womb. It means spiritually those that participate in this false wedding. And Christ, even when he was carrying the cross up that great hill to Golgotha where he was crucified, he made this statement in, what was it, Luke 23. He said, Hey, don't weep for me, you daughters of Jerusalem, but rather weep for yourselves, for the day shall come when it will be said, Blessed are the barren, those that remain true to the husband that's away. I, I want to pick that thought up today. You see, in the Old Testament, we covered quite a bit in the New Testament. Let's go to the Old in Isaiah chapter 54. With the thought of the barren and the days of that flood, being the same as the end in mind. Keep that in mind. Focus upon it. Now, we ask a word of wisdom from our Father, Isaiah 54, 1. Let's go with it. And it reads, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. Same thought as in Mark 13. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. And certainly the married wife has to do with those God chose before the foundations of this earth. Uh, have you got it? Verse 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. What is this saying? What God is saying, get ready, because at this time, then through the millennium, the family tent is going to enlarge. Those that were barren waiting for the true Christ through the millennium will bring many souls that see what a liar that Satan is into the kingdom. Yes, the millennium also is a time of salvation for those that God sent the spirit of stupor on as it is written in Romans chapter 11. Enlarge the family tent. Tabernacle 3, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit, your children shall inherit the, I prefer to say nations, translated Gentiles, but it should be nations, same thing, same word, and made the desolate cities to be inhabited. That is to say, bring God's truth when Satan is locked in the pit, and to on the first day of the millennium, what happens? Every knee bows to Christ. What a time that's going to be. Verse 4, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. You don't have to worry about it. The embarrassment that some will have when they realize they've been in bed with Satan himself and they call themselves Christians. It's going to happen. They are deceived already and don't even realize it because they're biblically illiterate. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. What does that mean? He's going to be with us after that second advent. Uh, verse 5, listen carefully. For thy maker is thine husband, not anyone else. Thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts, is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, 
the God of the whole earth shall be, shall he be called. And so it is as even the nations come to him, as we discovered in that uh, wonderful chapter in the great book uh, of uh, Revelation in chapter 21, verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. In other words, during the, the um, apostasy, uh, during the apostasy, many will fall away. But our Father hates no one and our Father will reunite. Our Father, for those that had the spirit of stupor, they will have that chance to see firsthand the uh, supernatural powers uh, that can deceive them, but how that they have the power to overcome. And I'm speaking in a spiritual sense. Don't make something out of that that isn't there. Verse 7, for a small moment, and as far as the eternity is concerned, that's all it is. Have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In other words, he trusts his elect to remain true, even while the spurious Messiah is on earth. But he will make it up. What a wonderful time ahead. All right, verse 8. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment but with everlasting kindness. I repeat, everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. In other words, the goodness of the kingdom, we would have great difficulty at even relating to it and or expressing it or explaining it. How wonderful it's going to be in his presence in good standing. Be patient and wait for the true Christ. Don't crumble into with before um, the deception of the wicked one. Verse 9. For this, now sharpen up for me and focus. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. Remember Christ's words? This is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. And what does that mean? That means that it doesn't matter about the tribulation. Our Father isn't angry at us. And as sure as he promised that the waters of Noah would no longer flood the earth, that he would see that he would never be angry with those that stood firm. And not that we're perfect. We fall short occasionally. But yet we stand firm to witness against the spurious Messiah, to stand for the true husband, our husband, the maker. And this is spoken in a spiritual sense also. So again, we see as in the days of Noah, so it shall be. How precious it is. Verse 10 to complete here in this chapter. For the mountain shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Don't ever worry about the tribulation, neither of them. There will be two. It is only the enemies of God that must worry about that tribulation. He promised that the same as he promised that there, the, the flood of Noah, would, the, those waters would never cover this earth. He gives you the promise that he will stay with you even through the tribulations of mountains parting and so on and so forth, but that his peace, his love, would always be with you. What is it that God will destroy from this earth in the first place? Only the wicked elements. Are you a wicked element? I think not. Then you don't have anything to worry about because that's the only thing. The creator, the maker 
of the souls when they return to the spiritual body at the last trump on the first day of the millennium, then our Father, for those that love Him, will weed out through the tribulation those that will not follow Him or through the judgment those that have declared themselves as lovers of Satan. And we won't be bothered with them anymore. Everlasting. But you see what the beauty of this is. Many of you are already a part of that wife. And you have known since you were a child that there was more to God's word than you had been taught. So as it was in the beginning, so it shall be at the end. As the promise concerning the floods of Noah, so is his promise at the return of the individuals, the entities, the say the Nephilim, the fallen angels, that you have nothing to worry about, for we have power through the peace and promise of our Father to the goodness uh, for you remaining a widow through the great deceptive marriage to the spurious Messiah. Your Father loves you very much. Now, what will happen then? We were told that uh, that this flood of lies would come forth and that also that God's elect would stand against the spurious Messiah. I want to take you to a number. We, the flood would be on the earth 150 days and Antichrist would have a five-month rule, both being 150 days. Thus, as it was in the beginning, so it is at the end. But what did God tell us in a prophetic way that we would be doing at that time? And you find out when the locust army is even on the earth, uh, on Pentecost Day, which Pentecost in the Greek tongue simply means 50, and it means Holy Spirit. Three times that Holy Spirit is 150 or a five-month period, which is to say the length of the time that Antichrist is on earth or the length of time that the waters overran the earth as we discovered in Genesis chapter 7, the last verse, 150 days, five months. But as Christ appeared on the 40th day and told them to remain in Jerusalem until they received what they had been promised, which is what 50 is uh, symbolic of, the Holy Spirit, until you receive it, stay there. And they did. But this day of Pentecost was a gathering in of all peoples, uh, from the various nations, different languages. And about nine o'clock in the morning, or a little before, the chosen ones, that is to say God's disciples through the Son, begin to speak in what is called the cloven tongue, meaning it, the sound came out in many directions, or properly translated came out in many languages. And it amazed all these various people that were there who needed interpreters to understand each other that when this tongue came forth, they all understood it even in the dialect of their, the county within which they were born. And the people of the various, I mean, you can't fake that's what I'm telling you. That only happens by the Holy Spirit speaking through man, not man blubbering or speaking. And it's saying nothing in any language. But being heard, and your documentation for that is in verse 6 and 7, it was not an unknown tongue. It was just the opposite. It was known by everyone that heard it. That's the Pentecost tongue spoken on Pentecost Day. Read it for yourself, Acts 6 or 7. Do you believe man or do you believe God's word? Choice is yours. Now, the important thing is this, though that three times that 50 through that five-month reign, from the time that the tongue comes and the tongues begin to confess the truth as they are delivered up, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them, do you think that is not written? And yet there is nothing new under the sun. For Peter explains it in Acts chapter 2. What does he say? Acts chapter 2 and pick it up, if you would, in verse 16, 
where Peter begins to speak. They said, these men are drunk. What is this thing going on? But Peter says, but this is that which was spoken by, jo by the prophet Joel. <clears throat> what does the word Joel mean? It's important. Yahweh is God, not Satan. That's why it was spoken from the mouth of Joel. So that you would, Yahweh, in other words, our God, our Father, I'll put it this way to, to put it in clear English perhaps. Our Father is God, not someone else. That's what the word Joel means. And that's why Joel the prophet was chosen to deliver that message. What, did, what does it say then? Peter, from the mouth of Peter, 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. And this being the ark of the last days, listen carefully, focus. In the last days, saith, said God, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, both male and female. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18, And on my servants and on my handmaidens, male and female, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 19, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Have you seen any of them? Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Many signs have been observed in this generation. I hope you're not asleep. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before, what? Before the great day the great and notable day of the Lord come. You all set for it? It's real simple. Our Father loves His children, but He will utilize those that He has chosen, His elect, to speak through as it is written in Mark 13, when they are delivered up, they will not premeditate what they will say before the false Messiah. This is the teachings of Jesus Christ, Mark 13, but will speak what is given for the, the, the true word must be published to the whole world. That's the purpose. Do you have a part in it? 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the point. That's the purpose. That's God's plan. What a precious time that's going to be. But now, I hope that as a teacher, that in my method of teaching, I hope that I have taught you if Peter or Jesus or anyone that is the prophet or uh, apostle in the New Testament tells you this is what Joel the prophet was talking about, I hope you're well enough focused by this time, you realize, well, hey, then what they really spoke on Pentecost Day is recorded in the book of Joel, which in the Hebrew tongue means Yahweh is God. You got it, friend. That's exactly what it means, and it will tell you exactly what you will be doing at that time. We're going to go to the Minor Prophets. The book of Joel, immediately following the book of Hosea, go to chapter 2. Let's find out what those tongues were saying on Pentecost Day. That's what's very important, and it has to do with the last days, you today. Focus, think. Chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. That's nation. Let all the inhabitants of the land, how many? All the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. I thank God for the trumpet he has given this platform to sound because it covers the world at this time. I thank him for that, and we will continue to sound it uh, to a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. 
as the morning spread upon the mountains, that's to say the nations, as they wake up to the new day, a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Do you know what army he's talking about? The locust army. The chapter preceding this has told us the four stages of the locust. Verse 3, A fire devoureth before them and behind them, a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Satan, this is the same as the ninth chapter of Revelation. That's what the tongues were speaking of on Pentecost Day. That the Satan and his troops, before their lies, would come out upon the people. They would strip them clean bare of any knowledge or wisdom that they might have had if they happened to be biblically illiterate. He looks like the lamb, meaning he looks like Christ, uh, but he has the voice of the dragon as it is written in Revelation 13, verse 11. Now, verse 4. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. That's always as meaning power. And as horsemen, so shall they run. In other words, they're called locust in chapter 1. But he said, they look like horses, meaning men of war. But it's the same horses mentioned in Revelation 9 during that five-month period reign of Satan. Verse 5, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. This is how strong the enemy is. Do you know God calls this his army? Let that comfort you for he even controls the enemy by allowing him. I don't know how many of you have ever stood beside a field where the wheat stubble is set on fire on a day behind it and you stand off and it roars and, and is a vicious, terrible thing. That's what that army will look like uh, in a spiritual sense. The deception, the lies, the deceit. Verse 6, Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. The true translation is paleness. Seven. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. They're well disciplined. They are well organized. And certainly our Father is, allows it. That's how deceiving and how impressive the miracles they perform in the face or before the eyes of men shall cause them to become. Verse 8, Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. In other words, they are effective. Naturally, they're supernatural. And everyone, it is so well organized with the deception that if the prophetic utterance has not been given directly from the Holy Spirit, this is that that Joel spoke of, then man's thoughts could not handle it. But with the presence of the Holy Spirit speaking before men and women, you've got nothing to worry about because God told you just as sure as he promised the flood water of Noah would never go that he would always be with you. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. And here you know it is entities to deceive. Uh, through modern media, they come into your home whether you like it or not. Uh, verse 10, the earth shall quake before them. The heaven shall tumble, tremble rather. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Exactly as it is written in the book of Revelation, in the book of Matthew, and in the 13th chapter of Mark. And so it is. 
our Father allows. One more verse so that we identify them. Verse 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? This is God's way of checking people, giving them a pop quiz. God allows this army that is his army, which consists of Satan, and his fallen angels, and all the deception that can be cast against people. How good are you? It's test day. How good of a Christian are you? Are you going to stand? You don't have to be afraid because God has already promised you this is a tent revival. This is the greatest deception ever placed on earth to see how many will follow Satan because they're biblically illiterate thinking he is Jesus or how many will hold to the cross, the maker, our true husband. It's up to you, friend. It's up to you. But one very rewarding feeling that you should carry and remember always, in as much as God calls it his army, you see, he controls everything. You understand that? Certainly if he controls that army, he's not going to let it hurt you. He has given you power over it. Again, I would remind you in... in um, Luke chapter 10, verse 18, he beheld Satan as a star come to the earth with his little fallen angels to deceive the world, to control this army for that five-month period as mentioned in Revelation 9. But he gives us power over them. Do you understand? They can't bother you. Now, for the sake of time, skip on to the 25th verse. But remember where we're pulling from, Acts chapter 2, Peter saying that that was spoken on Pentecost Day, this is that that was spoken by Joel the prophet. That's how it's going to be in the end. Again, it speaks, as it did in that ninth chapter, how you get on that ark. You get on that ark by having these words in your forehead, which is the seal of God, which is to say the word of God. Verse 25, it reads, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the, uh, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. That's all four stages of the locust in actual physical insect, whereby you can better understand by doing your work to come to that understanding of how they operate. And then he continues, my great army which I sent among you. God wants to be proud of his children. He thinks you can handle it. And if you have his word in mind, you can. Okay? And he sends the army among you. Now let's continue with verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Are you worried about it? I hope not, because he will deal wondrously with you throughout all that period that some say, my heavens, it's the tribulation. Well, yes, it is. But you're a child of God. Don't forget it. He promised you, I will never release wrath against you. Now, if you don't believe God, well, you might as well quit trying to be a Christian in the first place. 27, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. Now, do you believe that or not? And none else, not Satan, not some other husband, and my people shall never be ashamed. What a wonderful thought. Some will be so ashamed they'll pray for mountains to fall on them when they realize they woke up, they have awakened in the sack with Satan himself. Threw it all out the window because they believed that the lies of Satan saying, I'm going to fly you out of here, sweetheart. First trip out, I am Messiah, Jesus returned. 
He's a liar. 28. And it shall. Did it say maybe, perhaps, well, it could? No. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Do you have a destiny? Do you listen to your father? Now, again, both male and female will participate in this war for the circumcision is no longer of the flesh but the heart. Verse 29, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. When they are delivered up before this false system, God himself, the Holy Spirit, will speak through them. And it is written in Luke 21 that what they speak, even the gainsayers themselves are convinced by what they say. Verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Do you have to worry about it? Do you know what that's symbolic of? Divine judgment. Now, in our Father bringing forth his divine judgment, does he pour his anger or, or the destruction on that that he wants to save? I think not. What kind of God do you think we serve? The same, and I repeated this two times already, I think, in this lecture, this particular subject, rather, that God performed an act in the book of Daniel whereby you could understand his divine judgment when by the king's judgment of the three Hebrew children not bowing to the image 606, that's what it figures, it's whereby you have a type of the 666, they wouldn't buy a bow, so a earthly king sentenced them to death in the furnace, man's tribulation. But what happened? They weren't even singed, and behold, Christ appeared in the furnace with them, and they walked out not even being able to smell the smoke on them. That was God's way of saying, trust me, I love you, I can protect you wherever you are in the when the deception against Satan takes place. Verse 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness, uh, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the, the, of the Lord come. In other words, the brightness of his coming is something else. And, um, and uh, so we'll stop there. The Lord's day is coming. The ark of the last days you were told by our Father directly that he gave Satan orders in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. You cannot touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. That creates the ark of the end time that protects you from anything that Satan has to dish out. It also brings you into the loving grace of your Father, whereby that he, you are under his wing and his protection, and I assure you nothing can harm you there. We use common sense? Yes. The ark of the end times, as it was in the beginning, so it is in the end. Our Father has a wonderful way of teaching us, as though we are children, for we are. But he says, look, I'm going to tell you a story of what happened to your ancestors and believe me, it's going to happen this same way in the end. That's what Jesus told you. It's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving in marriage, giving and marrying and dancing in marriage to the Nephilim again because Revelation 12, 7 stipulates they're cast out on this earth. Paul would say for the women, keep Christ over your head. That's the veil. Many, many Bible bumpers call it a hat. All right, well, it's Christ. Because of the angels. Why? They're coming to seduce again. Make sure they don't seduce you spiritually. That's what they really want. The ark of the end times. But our Father teaching in such a way that anyone that has anything on the ball can read what happened before because it's going to happen again. Don't be deceived. 
by placing the truth in your mind of what happened then, which is to say the Word of God, you will not be deceived. How precious to be aboard the ark of the last days. Got your ticket? Do you know what your ticket is? The Word of God. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? <laughs> 